The models in this video are made by Kuzim or Adam Midzuk and are animated by Zulazrin Zulkifli. This video is based on an article written by paleontologist and fish fiend Tyler Greenfield. You can follow the antics of Greenfield and the 3D artists and animators via their many social media links in the description and comment section below. The advent of cryptozoology has seen many folks try to fit an increasingly unlikely and incredible field of pseudoscience into the realm of that which is quantifiable, testable, repeatable. One of the strangest examples is the continual parroting that Megalodon could still live among us in the world's oceans because we know more about the region of space directly outside of the Earth's atmosphere than the bottom of the ocean. This is nonsense as this simple rhetorical device does not, therefore, prove the plausibility of a 60-foot shark evading human detection for a century or more. The proof many nutters have provided have turned up total bollocks, and one of the most well-known pieces, aside from photos of photoshopped fins, was the discovery of modern megalodon teeth at the bottom of the ocean. From the dawn of our species, we have wanted to understand the unknown. No better petri dish for the unknown than the ocean. It's way easier and there are more benefits from sailing on top of the ocean than to try and traverse the undersea. It's what created trade routes between countries and the massive ship economies with a centuries long history. It is also the first method used by early scientists to collect data about the ocean to help form the bedrock for the study of oceanography. One of the most significant expeditions to understand the world's oceans was the Challenger Expedition. This saw the HMS Challenger and its initial crew of 21 officers and 216 crewmen circumnavigate the globe from 1872 to 1876. Their objectives were to investigate the physical conditions of the deep sea in the great ocean basins in regard to depth, temperature, circulation, specific gravity, and penetration of light. To determine the chemical composition of seawater at various depths from the surface to the bottom, the organic matter in solution, and the particles in suspension. To ascertain the physical and chemical character of deep sea deposits and the sources of these deposits and to investigate the distribution of organic life at different depths and on the deep sea floor. The expedition was responsible for finding the deepest point of Earth's oceans, the eponymous Challenger Deep, for finding 4,700 new species of marine life, and for revolutionizing the understanding of the ocean, which had previously been a mostly speculative field. Among the many living and quickly dying specimens they trawled from the depths were the fossilized or semi-fossilized remains of now extinct animals. In 1875, the HMS Challenger was in Tahiti and dredging stuff up from the seafloor, which, at that location, was about 2,385 fathoms or 2.71 miles deep. Once they brought the stuff up to the ship, they had found that they had collected a slew of shark teeth. Among the teeth were those of the Megalodon, then named Carcharodon Megalodon, and which is now named Otodus Megalodon. Paleontologist Maurice Lariche, who happened to have been born the year the Challenger collected the Megalodon teeth, wrote extensively on many fossil sharks from the Tertiary period, which is a widely used but now obsolete term for the period between 66 million years ago to 2.6 million years ago and is now better covered by the Paleogene and Neogene periods. In this 1936 paper, Larish discussed the geologic age for many megalodon specimens, one of which consisted of those teeth found by the Challenger. 
Luis determined that the Megalodon may have been around as recently as the Pleistocene epoch. Unfortunately, I could not find any reference that explained exactly why he presumed this, but perhaps it was the recent look to the Challenger teeth and the known disappearance of the animal at around the 3.6 million year mark that made him think it possible they lasted a tad longer. Regardless, it was Larish's work that was referenced more than 20 years later by zoologist Vladimir Chernetsky. Chernetsky noted that Larish noted the Pleistocene Meg possibility and then went on to try to quantify it. Chernetsky said that some of the shark teeth from the expedition, notably the Meg teeth, were utterly encrusted in a layer of manganese dioxide. One tooth was more encrusted than the other. For those definitely interested, manganese dioxide is one of a few manganese oxides that also forms a long, thin, branching mineral stain in between pieces of rock, resulting in a plant-like, fractal pattern that has tricked many people to think they are fossils, leading to the term pseudofossil. Chernetsky figured that if you were able to measure the thickness of the manganese dioxide layer on the teeth, then you might be able to quantify how old the tooth is since manganese dioxide has a rate of growth. At the time, the growth rate of manganese dioxide was figured as 0.15 to 1.4 millimeters per 1,000 years. They measured that the manganese dioxide was one and a half times thicker on the upper surface of the nodules than on the lower surface. Both teeth had their bases and a lot of the inside of the tooth eroded out, making them look like they had been ripped out of their sockets. The dentine had completely decayed away in the first tooth with a much thicker layer of manganese inside it than on the outside upper surface. Chernetsky could not just whole cloth use the usual technique of manganese dating on the manganese encrusting the inside of the teeth because it was intended for use on nodules, not the inside of teeth. Instead, he just dated the outside of the teeth. The color of these teeth was unusual in being a yellowish white quite a lot more like fresh teeth than millions years old fossil teeth. Chernetsky noted that the off-white of the center parts of the teeth may have indicated a geologically younger age. The usual darker color was present but only as a border of splotches around the outer edges of the teeth. Chernetsky measured the thickness of the coating with a petrological microscope, with the first tooth having a maximum thickness of 1.7 millimeters and a minimum thickness of 1.5 millimeters. Using the manganese dating, this would mean the coating took 11,333 years to form on this one tooth. The second tooth is darker than the first. The maximum thickness here was measured at 3.64 millimeters, meaning it took 24,206 years to gain the manganese shine. Chernetsky's conclusion was, therefore, that these megalodons died during the Pleistocene to Holocene epoch and that the species must have lasted this much later than initially thought. Unfortunately, his methodology and therefore results are completely erroneous. Chernetsky's analysis was refuted a 20-some-odd years later by fish fiends G.M. Belev and Leonid Glickman. Chernetsky had utilized a manganese dioxide growth rate based on past radium dating. Radium dating of manganese nodules yielded a growth rate 20 to 30 times larger than the more accurate ionium-thorium approach. As a result, the age looks to be substantially younger than it is. Furthermore, Melave and Glickman discovered that manganese dioxide deposition on shark teeth did not begin as soon as they fell to the ocean floor. Before being encased in manganese, the majority of these teeth had been significantly damaged, with the roots totally dissolved. With manganese out as a credible signal, the Challenger Megalodon teeth must be dated using coeval fossils. If every single locality where megalodon teeth are found also preserves the remains of sharks that also disappear from the fossil record at a specific time, a time that may also be before the reported early meg teeth times, then that infers none of them would have made it into the earlier times. Belave and Glickman discovered megalodon teeth in rock layers beside the ancestral white shark Carcharodon hastalis and the false mako Perotodus benedenii. Carcharodon hastalis and Perotodus benedenii are both shark species found in Myopliocene maritime environments. 
To identify them using contemporary taxonomy, paleontologist Tyler Greenfield investigated the Challenger's additional shark teeth, depicted in a description of specimens collected from the HMS Challenger expedition by doctors John Murray and A.F. Renard, published in 1891. Greenfield found that the Carcharodon hastalis and Perotidus benedenii specimens found amongst the meg teeth date the assemblage to the Miocene-Pliocene and refutes a more recent age. Even after the work of Vladimir Chernetsky was debunked, researchers continued to erroneously use manganese dating methods to come up with younger megalodon teeth. In 1988, another pair of fish fiends, Charles Rowe and Patrick Geistofer, published their work on megalodon teeth in which they utilized manganese dioxide to date teeth found off the coast of Madagascar. They calculated ages ranging from 15,000 to 60,000 years. However, because they also reported the presence of Perotidas, this recent event may also be discounted. With this incorrect technique having been disproven for over half a century, it is time to put Pleistocene-Holocene megalodon's claims to bed. Cryptozoologists must either believe that Megalodon is extinct or dismiss the scientific data. The latter would imply hypothesizing that other Miocene-Pliocene sharks survived undiscovered as well. So, no, Megalodon no longer stalks whales, it no longer roams the world's oceans, and there's no piece of data to suggest it does. The most scientific, the hardest, most reliable piece of evidence that many cryptozoologists and nutters have used to help them prove that Megalodon lives are these early teeth. As I and many others have pointed out, these are not recent teeth. Therefore, the claim is debunked thoroughly. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman.